All right. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me here, organizing this great conference. Um, it's going to be my pleasure to talk about some uh, ongoing work with uh, Jean-Francois, uh, with whom I learned so much while uh, I spent some time at CORE. And uh, this is work on uh, hierarchies and belief of uh, beliefs and uh, value of games in uh, zero-sum games. Uh, so before I come to talking about what is our contribution, I would like to take a little time machine and go back in time uh, before some work of Jean-François Mertens, and in particular before the work of Mertens and Zamir on uh, hierarchies of beliefs and uh, canonical information structures. And the reason why I like to do that is that uh, some of their contribution that we use every day seems now, uh, you know, almost... Uh, common material and, uh, you know, this seems uh, quite uh, straightforward and easy to us. And uh, at least I would fail to recognize the big difficulties that uh, arose uh, before uh, their contribution. So the puzzle was the puzzle nicely raised by uh, Ashani of uh, incomplete information. So I'm taking here some quotes of uh, the main papers of uh, Ashani who says that games with incomplete information give rise, or at least appear to give rise, to an infinite regress in reciprocal expectations on the part of the players. And he gives an example, and he says that, for example, let us consider any two-player game in which the players do not know each other's payoff function. Player one's strategy choice will depend on what he expects to be player two's payoff function, but it will also depend on what he expects to be player two's expectation about his own payoff function, and, of course, this happens to be and so on and so forth. So beliefs about beliefs about beliefs all seem to matter uh, in a very intricate way in a player's decisions. So if we want to uh, describe accurately all players' information, we have to take that into account. And Ashani comes to the conclusion that even if we succeed in defining the relevant higher order probability distributions in a mathematically admissible way, the resulting model will be extremely complicated and cumbersome. So it really looked like, at this point, really tackling this problem was really something difficult or maybe even impossible to do. So what Asani suggested was uh, a way to introduce models that have these properties, that these models describe the beliefs, they describe the beliefs about the beliefs, and so on and so forth, and those are the usual uh, type models, or Bayesian models. So we have a space of payoff relevant parameters that's affecting directly the payoffs of uh, the players. And we have type paces, ti for each player i. And an information structure is going to be described by a probability distribution over uh, payoff relevant states of nature. Now we call them this way. And profiles of types to the players. Okay? So the idea of the model is that a profile set of nature types to all the players is drawn by nature according to this probability distribution. And each player is informed about his own type. Okay? So what Arsani says is that if you have such a representation, of course each type defined through Bayes' rule a probability distribution, a conditional distribution on the states of nature that's going to be this player's belief about the state of nature. But because each type also defines the probability distribution of other players' types, a type also describes beliefs about other players' beliefs about a state of nature, and so on and so forth. So what Arshani says is that such a model describes beliefs, beliefs about beliefs, and so on and so forth. So it may look like, you know, we're done. This is, this is the solution to the problem. But it's not really clear because there may be other ways to describe beliefs and beliefs about beliefs which are not encompassed in these type of models. This is not something clear, at least from Asani. Uh, Asani didn't show anything like that. And second is, what are the good or the appropriate type spaces? Okay, every time you have a different problem, you may use a different type space. And um, this is when uh, Mertens and Zamir come to play. So I say this is take the bull by the horns because they really take the original problem that was posed by Arsani and they say, let's attack this problem directly. And what is it to uh, attack that? So they address the question of uh, representing hierarchies of beliefs in Bayesian models and provide a good definition of types in the following way. 
They first define, as everybody now knows, first all the beliefs, uh, beliefs about a state of nature. Second order beliefs about beliefs of state of nature and first order beliefs of the other player, and so on and so forth. So they inductively define kth order beliefs, and they introduce a uniform, a universal belief space, which is a product of all such spaces with a consistency requirement that if you have the case order belief, this also describes the k minus one and k minus two and so on, so order belief. So these are, uh, these are such uh, uh, sequences of beliefs with a coherent requirement. And so what Mertens and Zamir showed is that this universal type space fulfills Arsani's requirement, which is that a type actually describes a belief about a state of nature and other players' uh, beliefs or other players' types, okay? So this, um, type space is a good type space in the sense that uh, if you have a type of, the, of a player, you know what is this player's uh, beliefs about the state of nature and other players' types. Is this the only way to represent or to uh, construct a type space? Actually, you could construct maybe other type spaces that would be simpler than that. Well, another result and an important result by Merton and Zamir says the following. If you have something more general, an abstract mathematical tool, there's going to be a belief system, which is a family of spaces, so one space for each player, and mappings that tell you, given a, a type in one of the space for the player, what is this player's belief on the state of nature and on other player's types, okay? This is a belief system. If you have such a belief system, you can represent it, you can embed it into the uh, Mertens and Zamir universal type space using mappings from this arbitrary uh, belief system into the universal type space of Mertens and Zamir. So you define a diagram in the following way. This is your belief system here. If you have a type for a player, this describes a belief over a state of nature and other player's type. This is what happens here in the universal type space. If you have a type for a player, this describes a belief for the state of nature and other players' types. And you can embed each belief of a player into the universal type space in such a way that the diagram commutes. So what this is telling you is that all the beliefs and beliefs about beliefs and so on and so forth that you can embed in any belief system can be embedded in the Merton zamir type space. So in a sense, the Merton zamir type space is without loss of generality. Okay, so it's quite big, but you don't need anything bigger, and this can encompass all the beliefs and beliefs about beliefs about any uh, state of nature. All right, so what can you do using these type spaces? Well, you can go back to uh, what uh, Arshani worked with and define Bayesian uh, models. So you define the product of all types of all players. So this is the set of profiles of types. If you have a probability distribution over the state of nature of profiles and types, you call it consistent if the type of a player always coincides with the belief of this player on the state of nature and other player's type using Bayes' rule. Okay? So if you have a probability distribution over this product, you can look at the player's type given his type. That's the type is defining a belief. But you could also use Bayes' rule, and if the two approaches coincide, then you have what is called a canonical information structure. So in these type of models, the Bayesian beliefs and the universal types coincide. So, yeah, this is almost surely. I'm skipping this uh, little, that's right. So, and uh, yeah, that's right, okay? Yeah. So, what do we get from that? Well, using Bayesian models is, in a sense, with a loss of generality, okay? As long as you use the universal type space. And you have a canonical representation of information because all this information can be represented using the same spaces. You don't need to use a different type space for different models. So there are different things we get from that. Uh, we know that using Bayesian models is with a loss of generality. So we don't need to use a universal type space in, any in every uh, 
you know, incomplete information game that we want to represent. But we know that, in, you know, we are not losing anything by uh, restricting attention to Bayesian models. So we can just work as we usually do using Bayesian models. And the other thing is, if we want to have a good space for working about all the hierarchies of beliefs and so on and so forth, we have this uh, universal type space. And their study is interesting on itself. We can have work on topology and so on and so forth. So this is kind of, uh, you know, back in time. Now I would like to talk a little bit about uh, specifically the work with Jean-Francois. So the work of Jean-Francois consists of studying the value of information in zero-sum games from two different points of view. So we're going to ask if you have two information structures, two descriptions of information to the players, when are those two descriptions equivalent? There are different ways to look at this question. One is to say, well, if you have an information structure and you make some kind of basic transformation, this should be innocuous. Let's say you rename a state into a different name. This is basically the same information structure. So you could consider that such a transformation is an equivalence. And this is equivalence just based on the informational point of view. You just say, from the informational point of view, this information structure, that information structure are the same. And we're interested in what are equivalence classes, how can we represent these equivalence classes. The other question we're interested in is strategic equivalence. If you have two information structures, when is it the game that they are the same for the players in terms of playing games, in terms of zero-sum games, because this is what we are looking at? When is it the case that if you have two information structures, those two information structures give the same value in the zero-sum games. If you answer this second question, this means that two information structures that are not strategically equivalent give rise to different values in some games. So this means that in a strategic way, they describe different information. So strategic equivalence will help you understand what is strategically relevant information, what is strategically non-important information. So the framework for us is the framework of zero-sum games. Well, there are lots of uh, reasons why we're interested in zero-sum games. One is that uh, this is the simplest extension of decision problems. These questions are well understood in decision problems by the work of uh, Blackwell. And uh, it's always important, at least I think this was Jean-Francois' approach, to think, you know, let's move from decision problems to zero-sum games we'll see questions of general games uh, later. Let's work on foundations. And here, uh, zero-sum games are an excellent foundation. The second question, the second point is that uh, in general games, some information can be relevant, while it's not, it's, it, can be, it, can be, uh, it can be strategically relevant, it can be inform important in games, uh, while well, it's not related to uh, any information about payoffs. So this is the case in correlated equilibria. In a correlated equilibrium, players care about information because other players care about information. This is what uh, Eric referred to as bootstrapping. Okay? So there is no connection whatsoever to anything payoff relevant, but still players care about it because other players uh, do care about it. So in the setup of zero-sum games, this should go away. Uh, actually, we'll see that uh, this goes away. The they are relevant to other players, but not to you? If something, is, well, in a correlated equilibrium, the signals or types is not payoff relevant to anybody in the sense that it affects directly the payoff functions, but it affects everyone's payoff function through other players' actions. So what Eric referred to as bootstrapping is that I care about information only because other players care about it and back and forth. But at the end, this is not connected to anything that is payoff relevant in the sense of a state of nature. All right. So the third point that we like about zero-sum games is that a zero-sum game has a clear solution, which is the value. We don't have equilibrium multiplicity. If we wanted to work with uh, non-zero-sum games, we would have set of equilibria or set of equilibrium payoffs, and we would need to compare sets. And that would be a little bit more complicated than just comparing values 
of different zero sum games. And the last point that is somehow interesting uh, about zero sum games is that we have positive value of information. So adding information to a player in a zero sum game cannot hurt this player in the sense that the equilibrium payoff goes down. But we know that such phenomena of negative value of information occur uh, in general games, and they're actually very common. All right. So those are you know good reasons for studying zero sum games, and zero sum games are just interesting per se in general. Okay. So let's move to information equivalence. What uh, can we say about two information structures being equivalent? So we're going to have two players throughout the talk. And we fix a space K of states of nature. So these are the payoff relevant parameters. If you want, there is a sigma algebra on this uh, space. It's, um, well, if you ask me, uh, that would be compact metric, OK? But if you ask, ask Jean-Francois, uh, he, even separable was uh, too much of an assumption, all right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is actually one of the reasons why this work <laughs> took a little bit of time, uh, okay? So I'm going to be a little bit vague, but you can think of it as, so if, if it's finite, you can get rid of the sigma algebra. Uh, as uh, Jean-Francois pointed out, if you have already two states, a set of beliefs is already a continuum, so you may start with the continuum, right? So if you are in with something compact metric, you stay in compact metric, so I'm happy with compact metric, you know, myself, all right? Uh, so what is an information structure? Well, this is a space here, E, of states of the world that describe all players' information and players' information about players' information and so on and so forth about the state of nature. So in particular, it's going to describe the state of nature. So you have a map here, kappa, that associates to each state E what is the corresponding state of nature. So it's describing the state of nature. It's a probability space. You have a sigma algebra E and P, which is a probability over uh, states of the world. And you have a sub sigma algebra EI for each player I describing this player's information. Okay? And that's it. Kappa is describing the state of nature. So if you give me a state of the world, kappa of E is the state of nature at the state of the world, E. So I was using before these kind of uh, type space models in which we have a product space and each player is in form of the coordinate. Well, you can think of it as a particular case of these information structures, okay? E would be, in this case, the product of K and the set of signals or the set of types for each player. And each player would be in form of the coordinate, okay? So that's just a particular case. And uh, the reason why I'm working with these type of models is that I want to be able to change the sigma algebra of just one player. And if I do that, I'm just saying that I'm destroying information for this player. Okay? If I uh, use the product spaces, maybe I would need to merge signals or something. That would be a little bit more complicated, I think. All right? Okay, so here are some basic operations that I want to introduce between information structures. Let me say I have two information structures, E and E prime, possibly with different uh, uh, states of the world, different sigma algebra probability, and so on. The first transformation I introduce is decreasing the information of player i. So I say that I decrease the information of player i from e to e prime whenever e and e prime are the same, except that the information of e prime is a sub sigma algebra of the information in ei. Okay? So I just coarsen the information of player i. This is a decrease of information for this player. Okay. There are some decreases of information that are actually innocuous. If I replace a player's information by a sufficient statistic on everything that is relevant, then this should be innocuous, at least in zero-sum games. So for us, it's going to be uh, non-important. So E S I E prime is the case when E prime is a decrease of information for player i of E, but all beliefs of uh, player i are actually E prime measurable. So E prime is a sufficient statistics for uh, player i for E i on every event that is uh, in the sigma algebra 
of the player J and the state of nature. Okay, so this means that I'm not losing, I'm not destroying really any uh, significant information to player I about the information above player J and of the state of nature. Third transformation is really not important for us. This is a decrease of the general sigma algebra here, E. So this is just a sigma algebra on the state of the world, and it should not matter for uh, the information to the player. So this is D when I decrease the general sigma algebra on the states of the world. And finally, I want to have a fourth uh, type of transformation, which is the inclusion. Assume I have my uh, information structure he, here E, and I add some states that have probability zero, I get a new information structure, but one is just including the other one and adding these states that have probability zero is not affecting anything relevant. So this is the inclusion of E into E prime, okay? So those are basic transformations between two information structures. I could be interested in two things. I could be interested in the binary relation defined by the inclusion, the inverse of the inclusion. So those are neutral operations. A decrease of the general sigma algebra or increasing the general sigma algebra. Those are two also neutral operations. But this is decreasing the information of player i or increasing the information to player 2. Okay, so both should go the same way. If I give more information to player 1, or if I give less information to player two, both should be better for player one, okay? So this here should mean that this side should be better for player one than that side, and it should be worse for player two. I'm not going to say much about the ordering. I'm actually going to work on equivalence classes, and information equivalence is going to be the, <coughs> sorry, equivalence relation defined for this uh, relation here. All right? So if E is greater than E prime according to this binary relation and E prime is greater than E, then they are equivalent. So my question is, I want to characterize information equivalence, okay? So to do that, I'll come back to the idea of canonical information structures. If I have an information structure E, I can associate to this information structure a canonical information structure in a somehow unique way, meaning that there, is there are essentially unique mappings that go from the, uh, sorry, for, from the information of a player to this player's universal type space. So you associate to uh, every state of the world a canonical type for each of the players in such a way that the type of the player is actually this player's belief on the state of nature and the other universal types of all the other players given the information in the original information structure. So this type theta i is just a description of all the, these player i's hierarchy of beliefs at every state. This P is going to define a consistent uh, um, probability or a consistent information structure, and it is a canonical information structure associated to the information structure E. So let's be a little bit concrete and see what these canonical information structures include or describe <coughs> on what they do not describe. Here are two information structures, okay? In these two information structures, there are two states of, the, of nature, K1 and K2. But in the first, there are six states of the world. In the second, there are only four states of the world. Here, what do we have? In these two states, no player knows what is the state of nature. Okay? And it's actually common knowledge that they don't know. And that they have each probability one half, one half on K1 and K2. Okay? In these two, Player one knows what is the state, player two doesn't, and in these two, this is the same story, okay? So those two states and those two states are, in a sense, the same, and actually they are the same, they are associated to the same canonical state. This representation is basically the canonical information structure associated to that. There are only four states, 
And those two states and those two states have been merged. So this one with that one and this one with that one. Okay? And you see that in this state and in this state, the whole hierarchy of beliefs are the same. And in this state and that state, the whole hierarchy of beliefs are the same. Okay? So you can think of this information structure as being that one, except that in these two states, there has been a flip of a coin observed by the two players. And the flip of the coin is not part of the canonical information. So, yeah. <coughs> the second and the third. Oh, so this is information to the player one. This is information to player two. Two and three, this and that? Going to the right. Going to the right. They are identical, but this is an information structure where players have more information. Okay, they observe the flip of a coin, you can think. Okay? So a flip of a coin is not affecting the payoffs, but in general games there could be equilibria in which player strategies choose different actions here and there and here and there. Okay? In principle, that's a possibility. But these possibilities are excluded or they are they vanish if you just look at the canonical information structure. So every information structure is strategically equivalent, this is a result, to its canonical associated information structure. And the proof of this result is constructive. So we like to prove that those two information structures are informationally equivalent. How are we going to do that? Well, we are going to use a series of transformations that are every time equivalences. So let's look at this one and that one. I can go from this one to that one first by destroying some information of player two. Okay? Once I destroy information to player two, from this to that, this is a sufficiency for player one. Because here and there, player one has the same information about player two's information and about the state of nature. All right? So you can see that in this state and in that state, player one knows that player two is in one of these four states. Okay? Actually, he knows that, uh, yes, that player two is in one of these four states and that uh, the state is K1. So you can put the two together and you could put those two as well together. So you move from this to that by destroying information to player two and a sufficiency for player one. But you could have done it the other way around. You could have first destroyed information to player one and then done a sufficiency to player two. Okay? So because destroying information to player one and sufficiency for player two is worse for one, but destroying information for player two then sufficiency for player one is better for one, the two are equivalent. So those two are equivalent. Now we would like to move from this one to the canonical information structure. You're going to do it in several steps. First, you destroy a little bit of the general sigma algebra by merging this state with this state and this state with that state. Okay? You're not transforming any information to the player here. You're just changing the general sigma algebra. But you could do it the other way. From this information structure to that one, you could also destroy the general sigma algebra. So you see that this one and that one are the same, except for touching the general sigma algebra. But the trick is that you've moved the probabilities of 1, 6, 1, 6 here to these two states, 1 third, 1 third. Okay? So now that you've done that, you realize that you have states of probability 0 here. And the last step is to get rid of them. And how do we get rid of them? Well, using sufficiencies, because this has probability zero, uh, you know, they are irrelevant to the players. So they are irrelevant for sufficient statistics. So you can use two sufficient statistics to cut them off from all the rest. And from this one to that one, you see that you have two states with probability zero that are completely separated. So this is the last, uh, the last item, which is the inclusion. Okay? So this proof illustrate that every information structure is information equivalent to its canonical uh, associated one. All right? So what we don't know yet is can two distinct canonical information structures be, can be information equivalent? Okay? We know that if they have the same, 
information, uh, canonical information, then they are uh, information equivalent. But the equivalence classes could be coarser. OK. To answer this question, we're going to move to strategic equivalence. We're going to talk about values in games. OK. So now we introduce payoffs. So a payoff structure is given by two action sets and a payoff function from states of nature, actions of player one, actions of player two, to the real uh, payoffs. The strategy space for player i is a set of measurable mappings from this player's information to the mixed actions. And the associated payoff to a pair of strategies is just the expected payoff in the game with incomplete information. So a first result that we need to work in the general setup, but that's a basic result, is the min-max theorem saying that these games, that are zero-sum games, have a value. All right? So we denote this value Vg of E. And the question we ask is, when is it the case that two information structures gives the same value in every zero-sum game? If this is the case, we call them strategically equivalent. OK? So what do we know? Well, we know that if one information structure is, in a sense, better for player one in the sense of information than another information structure, this is going to give at least the same payoff in every zero-sum game. This is quite a straightforward result. So we can look at the different transformations. Decreasing the general sigma algebra inclusion sufficiency are innocuous for information. They will not change the value. Now, if you increase the information to player one, it means you make a finer sigma algebra. You increase the strategy set. So the mean max will go up. And if you decrease information for player two, the same result will go, right? So uh, you have monotonicity of value with respect to information in this sense. OK. So in particular, if two information structures are equivalent for information, they are equivalent strategically. They are equivalent in payoffs. OK. A theorem is that this is if and only if. If two information structures are strategically equivalent, then they have same canonical information structure associated, and they are actually uh, uh, informationally equivalent. OK. So the if part here is, uh, from what we know, every information structure is equivalent in terms of information to its canonical one. And so it gives the same payoff in, uh, every, uh, in every zero sum game. The only if part is a difficult part. It shows that all information, the canonical information structure, is strategically relevant. So if you touch the canonical information structure, you're going to touch the value in some zero-sum game. Okay? So what can we do? What can we do to show that? Okay? Let's think again about this hierarchy of beliefs. Let's say, assume that two information structures are strategically equivalent. They give the same value in every zero-sum game then it must be the case that they give the same value in every decision problem. Those are the simplest zero-sum games. Just one player decides, and the payoff depends on this player's action and the state of nature. Okay? So let's look at all these decision problems. The payoff to a player or both players depends on the state of nature and the action of player i. If the values of all these simple decision problems or all these decision problems are the same under E and F, then it means that the player i has basically the same information about the state of nature in E and in F. So the first order beliefs must coincide. Okay? And this is known from uh, Blackwell's results of comparison of uh, statistical experiments. Moreover, and this is something that Claude was talking about this morning, we can construct a universal kind of decision problem in which a player uh, has to announce its own first order belief in order to maximize payoff. So one way to do that is using scoring rules, or we may need something a bit more general than scoring rules if the uh, state k is not finite, but a, more, uh, uh, a bigger space. Okay? So we can construct such a decision problem in which the unique optimal action is to announce one's belief. Now we like to move on. And force players not only to reveal their first order belief, but their second order belief. So what we're going to do is to introduce decision problems in which 
the payoff will depend on what player one, let's say player I does against the state of nature and what player J does, but the payoff here, the second component, will depend on the action of player J and on the state of nature and on what player one does. Okay? If we knew that here player one announces his true belief, we would be fine because we would just ask player two to announce a belief about player one, so that would be a decision problem and we would be back to the previous slide. But the problem is that now player I has incentive not to reveal the truthful belief about the state of nature because this is a way to fool player two who is going to predict what player one announces. Okay? So the trick is to make this perturbation here as small as possible. Okay? We consider a game in which at the first order each player has to announce, or player I has to announce, a belief about the state of nature. And what is optimal to do is to do it truthfully. And we perturb this game by a game in which player two is going to guess what player one announces. Okay? So this is why we have epsilon here. This is considered to be a small perturbation. The idea is that if this is a small perturbation, player one, player I, should not have incentive to lie too much. And he should announce something close to his true beliefs. And uh, we should be able to move on. How can we technically prove that? So there is a great tool here that's called Mills derivative. Let me just mention Mills derivative here uh, in a few words. So it says the following. If you have two games, two pair of functions, gamma 1, gamma 2, they may be of complete or incomplete information. It doesn't matter. Where strategy spaces are A1, A2 to the real numbers. And you look at the game gamma 1 with payoff function gamma 1 and an epsilon perturbation in the direction gamma 2. Then the derivative of the value of this game with respect to epsilon, when epsilon is close to 0, so ep this is really a perturbation, is the value of the game gamma 2 in which players are restricted to play optimal strategies in the game gamma 1. Okay? So I think this is a general version of the envelope theorem in a sense. Okay? So, okay. so again, you have this game gamma 1 plus epsilon gamma 2, right? This is a small perturbation. So we look at the derivative, how the value depends on this epsilon, okay? At the first order, player who want to play optimal strategies in here, gamma 1, okay? So you may think that what happens is that these players really play optimal strategies, okay? Because epsilon is really small. And then when you move epsilon, they choose among their optimal strategies the one that are the best for the second component, which is gamma 2. So you look at the game in which strategy spaces are the optimal strategy in gamma 1, and you look at the value of this game when the payoff function is gamma 2. This is the derivative of the payoff function. And Mill's result says that this is really the derivative of this value of that game. Okay? So what does it give us now in our framework? If we look at our part of decision problem, the Mill's derivative when player I announces a belief about the state of nature and player J receives uh, something that depends on uh, announcement of one player one does with a weight epsilon. This is the value of the decision problem in which player J is trying to guess the state of nature and what player I does. Sorry, so what player I does is what is the announced first or the belief of player one. And player I is actually truthful because player I has to play an optimal strategy in the game that has the highest weight. Okay? So now we kind of manage to have player I announce the truth. And so if all these values are equal under two information structures, then the Mills derivative must be equal as well. We chose that player two's information on K and player one's first order belief are the same in I and J, in sorry, in E and in F. And so player J's second order belief is the same in the two information structures. And we can move on and so on and so forth. And it must be that E and F give the same value. If they give the same value in every zero-sum game, the whole hierarchy of beliefs must coincide in E and F. <coughs> Which is not a finite game. So, would it be true that 
Yeah, I don't think that the result requires A1 and A2 to be finite. Even in the one decision problem, take the one decision problem, take the one interval, and your action is some point function almost flat. Your optimum is at one half. But the gamma 2 is a payoff that is linear with the slope. So by changing a little to the right, you will gain here. But epsilon is very, very small. I don't know. Yes. You, you need optimal strategies, I agree. Once you have optimal strategies, you step back. Then you can have a stack. Don't have optimal strategies. When you have epsilon optimal, then you have a Then you may be in trouble. You want to stay away. Yeah. OK. So to wrap up what we've seen here, we've seen that if the values are equal given two information structures, E and F, the whole hierarchy of beliefs under E and F must coincide. So they have the same canonical information structure associated. So our conclusion is going to be the following. Information equivalence implies strategic equivalence. This is the easy part. If uh, you do some innocuous transformations in information, you don't touch the value in games. But strategic equivalence implies the same canonical information structure. So this is the part that we've seen with the mill derivative and reconstructing the hierarchy of beliefs from the play in different zero-sum games. But we know now that if two information structures have the same canonical information structure associated, they are also information equivalent. So if we put everything together, Information equivalence and strategic equivalence are the same. So two information structures are strategically equivalent if and only if they are informationally equivalent. Plus, we know that the equivalence classes are given by the canonical information structures. So if you have two different canonical information structures, you must have different values in some zero-sum games. So just a word about canonical information structures. Uh, all hierarchies of belief matter in zero-sum games. Okay? We know that they matter in general games, but this is easier to show. In zero-sum games, our instrument is far more restricted. This is why we had to use this uh, trick about perturbations. Okay? And uh, perhaps this is a further reason to study the universal belief spaces and canonical information structures. Thank you. Or, or how far can it be generalized in the sense that it holds for more than two players constant sum? Or does it hold for potential games? Even constant sum, I, I guess you could, you know, I'm, okay, so I, I we have to be careful here about constant sum. It's true that you can, you know, as you know, make it a two player arbitrary game between two players and use the third player as a bank. Uh, but maybe we have to be careful about what this implies with uh, the information to this player. I think in general, when you have more than two players, even if you are in constant sum, you have more degrees of freedom in terms of uh, changing, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, payoff functions that you can use. Okay, so I, I guess it would be easier to uh, show some of the results, which. Well, I'm not sure even which because I wouldn't have uniqueness of Nash payoff. Okay, so I would like to have at least uniqueness of Nash payoff. Otherwise, we need to compare sets of uh, of equilibria, and saying if something is an equilibrium here, it has to be an equilibrium there. But then the idea is a little bit different because um, of this possibly negative value of information. I cannot compare uh, payoffs ordinarily. So. I'm not sure, you know, this is, I think it's a little bit of a different world outside of the zero sum game to uh, general classes of games. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Give us 10 minutes. Give us 10 minutes. Inter 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 In